And that's what we're going to talk about today. It's so good to see all of you here today worshiping with us. I'm Tony Wallister. I'm one of the pastors here at Silverdale. You may not realize this, but we are one church in many locations. We have one body, but we have nine weekend worship services each weekend. And I'm so thankful that you're a part of this one here at our Bonnie Oaks campus today. This is what I want to encourage you to do. Go and take your Bibles and open up to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 10. Or you can open your smartphone, open to Romans chapter 10. And then do this as well. Take out these um, Bible study outlines. They're found right here and you can follow along and take notes. Um, today I want us to talk about missions. You, you see, I've got some good news for you. This Friday we're kicking off our Global Impact Missions Conference. And it really is the highlight of our years. And I'm so stoked about it. I mean, the fact is, is that most of you hopefully got this little flyer and in it, you see all the different ways that you can connect with our missionaries and hear from our missionaries, and you know, it all really kicks off on the Friday night meet and greet. So I hope all of you are part of that. But, but here's the amazing thing. Most of our missionaries were sitting in the same seats you're in. And then just a few years ago, and God called them, and they answered God's call to missions. And, and we literally have missionaries around the world on every continent on this planet. Now, we don't have anybody on Antarctica, but other than that, we've got missionaries all around this world. And our missionaries are coming back this week. And we've got missionaries coming from Africa, Japan, South America, Cuba, um, several from the Middle East, the Czech Republic, Indonesia. I mean, they've all come back to share with you. And I thought, you know, no better way for us to prepare to hear from our missionaries than to answer a simple question. Why? I mean, why? Why do we do missions? I mean, why should we be involved in missions? Why should we give to missions? Why missions? Well, here's the answer. The answer is very simple. The gospel demands it. The gospel demands it. Now, I get that our culture doesn't believe the gospel, right? I mean, we live in a world today that has this belief. It's, it's basically universalism. Okay, what does that mean? Well, it just means this, that most people in our culture today, they believe that if you're sincere and in your beliefs, whatever that may be, whatever religion you have, that in the end, it all is all just going to work out. And since, you know, there's not one way to God, it's just what, if you're sincere, you're going to get to heaven, right? That's what our world believes. It's, it's universalism. And if that's true, then you don't need to pray for your one. You don't need to invite anybody to church, and we definitely don't need to do missions and send people all around the world. Why? Because if it's all just going to work out, why, why do that? Now, we as Christians, we'd push back on that a little bit, and we go, eh, I don't believe that. I mean, I believe Jesus really is the only way. But what is sad for most Christians is that we become basically functional universalists. You go, what do you mean? By our inaction by our reality that we're silent about the gospel. And even though we may say we believe this stuff, by our actions, we don't. And yet Jesus made it very clear. In fact, I want you to see this outlandish claim that Jesus makes. It's found in John chapter 14, verse 6. Look at what God's word says. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, our culture today hears that, and they go, how dare we say that? How narrow-minded could you possibly be? And we go, well, I didn't claim that. That's what Jesus claims. Now, here's the deal. Our society, they don't have a problem with us coming to Jesus and finding salvation in Jesus. They don't. In fact, they'll applaud us. They'll go, I'm so happy for you. I'm so glad you found a path to God. I'm so happy for you. But then you say, well, actually, the path that I found to God is the very same path you need to God. And they go, what? How dare you? I mean, how, how arrogant of you. How can you claim that you know the one way? And then they'll push back with these questions. What about that innocent person in South America that's never heard the gospel? What about that sincere seeker in China? I mean, how in the world can you say that God's going to hold people accountable for something they've never even heard before? And we hear these objections and we sort of, you know, shrink back and we go, well, you know what? I know God is good and I guess it's all just going to work out and God's fair and good and all that kind of stuff. And then what happens? We become, by our lack of effort, we become functional universalists. 
Well, the Apostle Paul was not that. And today what we're going to do is we're going to look at the book of Romans. The book of Romans is the Apostle Paul's treatise on the gospel. And he, in eloquence and incredible logic, goes point by point explaining why Jesus had to come. Why the gospel is so necessary. Why we must do missions. Now, let me say at the forefront that for some of you, you may be offended by this message because this is not politically correct, okay? You're going to be offended by this message. And you may be turned off a little bit. But for those of you who really grasp it and understand it, it will light a fire in your heart that nothing in this world can ever extinguish. That's what was going on with the Apostle Paul. And so I want us to look at these basic steps of why we should be involved in missions. Ready? Number one is this. Here's the gospel. Number one, all people know there's a God. All people know intuitively in their heart of hearts that there really is a God. Look at how the Apostle Paul puts this in Romans chapter 1, verse 19. He says, what can be known about God is evident among them. Because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. The Apostle Paul says, just take a look at creation, right? I mean, you, you wake up this morning and the sun was out. <gasps> oh my goodness, there is a God, right? Right? You see a sunrise, a sunset, right? You, you look at order and you know somebody had to put order in there. You see design, you know there has to be a designer. You look at beauty. I mean, I look in the eyes of my wife and I realize she's just not some biological machine. No, she's somebody with a soul. She's somebody who's made in the image of God. We, we have eternity on our hearts. And so what the Apostle Paul does is he gives us two proofs for the existence of God. Creation. And in fact, I've put it this way up on the screen. The argument from design. This is just basic logic, right? Here it is. Every design has a designer, right? The universe has complex design. Therefore, the universe had a designer. Something never comes from nothing, right? I mean, you know, you see design, there has to be a designer. You see organization, you know that somebody had to organize it. You see a house, you know there had to be an architect. If you see creation, the Apostle Paul says, you know there had to be a creator, right? It's just basic logic. In fact, it's irrefutable logic, okay? There's a second argument that the Apostle Paul gives. He says not only creation, he says your conscience. I mean, basically, we all have a conscience. We all intuitively know right from wrong. We know in our heart of hearts we shouldn't lie. We, we know we shouldn't steal. We, we know these things intuitively, and yet, in fact, when we do those things, even though nobody's taught us that, we feel guilty. They're like, oh my goodness, wh where does this come from? You see, there is a universal law. You go to the ends of the earth, all of humanity has basic laws, moral standards on our heart. If that's the case... Where did that come from? Well, so here's the second argument, the argument from moral law. There is a moral law within every person, therefore, there must be a lawgiver. And that's why you can go to the ends of the earth, in every culture, in every region of the world, you will find people worshiping God. Why? Because all intuitively, we know in our heart of hearts, there really is a God. Now, I mean, you probably know the story of um, Helen Keller. Helen Keller was... Um, you know, born okay, but then as a toddler, she got meningitis and a real high fever. And from that, she lost her sight, she lost her hearing, she lost the ability to communicate. And so she got a tutor. Her name was Ann Sullivan. And Ann Sullivan began to try to communicate with Helen through touch. That's where Braille comes from. Now, Ann Sullivan is a follower of Jesus Christ. And so when she finally was able to communicate with Helen, she then begins to tell her about God. And this is what Helen said whenever she was hearing about God. She made this statement. She says, oh, I know him. I've known him a long, long time. I just didn't know what to call him. Now, how is it that this person that has complete lived their entire life in darkness had an innate ability and understanding of God. It's simple. We all have it. All of humanity know in our heart of hearts there is a God. God's put it there in creation and in our conscience. 
okay? This is what we do. Number two is this. All people have rejected God. Even though we know in our heart of hearts there is a God, we basically say, I don't want no God telling me what to do. Notice how Paul puts this in Romans chapter 1, verse 21. For though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. We know there's a God, but I don't want to follow God. I don't want to, you know what, I'm going to suppress the truth. I don't want to obey God and his rules. I mean, I know that I should be loving and giving, but I am selfish. I know that I shouldn't steal, but I do. I know I should be honest, but I lie. I know I shouldn't commit adultery. I know I should honor my parents. Those are things that I intuitively know, but I don't want to follow God's rules. I want to go my own way. And we know I'm going to push God and what I know about God aside. It's rebellion. There was a very remote tribe in Ecuador, and they were cannibals for years. And then you had these missionaries that came and reached out to them, brought the gospel to them. Almost the entire village was converted. Later on, one of their elders made this statement. He said this, I've noticed that many of you Westerners think that we ran around killing and eating people because we just didn't know any better. That's not true. We always knew that there was a deity and that he was displeased with what we were doing, but we wanted to do it anyway. Now, I know that none of you here are probably cannibals, right? But the truth is we're cannibals in our own way. We know the truth about God. We know what God wants us to do, and we say, no, I want to rule myself. I want to be my own God. Now, think about this. If there really is a God, then knowing him and seeking him should be our number one pursuit, right? But it's not. Do we make seeking God our number one pursuit? No. I'm going to seek after money. I'm going to seek after the approval of others. I'm going to seek after sex. I'm going to seek after some pleasure. I'm going to seek after something that's going to gratify me. I'm not going to seek after God. That's called rebellion. That's the core of who we all are. That's, that's what sin is. Think about this. I mean, Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. If that's the greatest commandment, then when we don't do that, it's the greatest sin. And so we intuitively know that there's a God, but we do not want to submit to that God. We want to go our own way. And that is why people become atheists. Folks, people do not become atheists because they've reached some logical conclusion by looking at the facts. No, that's not the case. You read the writings of atheists like Richard Dawkins or Christopher Hitchens. They'll tell you right out, I don't want no God telling me how to rule my life. And because that's their premise, it clouds everything they see. And they come to the conclusion there's no atheist, I mean there's, there's no God, but they reach that conclusion because they don't want there to be a God. And so here's the deal. Look at how Paul puts this. In Romans chapter 1, verse 28, he says this, And because they did not think it worthwhile to acknowledge God, God delivered them over to a corrupt mind. That's all of humanity. We know there's a God, but we've all, in one way or another, even religiously, have rejected that God. And because of that, it leads to the third truth. Jot this down. All people are guilty before God. All of humanity, all people are guilty before God. That's Paul's conclusion. If we've all rebelled against God, then we're all guilty. Look at how he puts this, Romans chapter 3. In fact, the entire chapter 3, Paul teaches this. There is no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. Conclusion, verse 23, for all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us, every person on this planet, we resist God's rules. We, we resent God's um, reign, and so we're going to go our own way. You, you see, a lot of us, what we do is we don't understand how wicked our hearts are and how wicked sin is. We look at sin and we go, okay, bad sin, like if you do drugs or you sleep with somebody outside of marriage. Yeah, that's sin. But you know what? The real sin is at its core, it, it, it is cosmic treason. It's knowing that there's a God and then shaking your fist at him and saying, you ain't ruling over me. I'm going to be my own boss. I'm going to live my own life. You ain't telling me how to live my life. That is what we do. And because every person on this planet has had that kind of heart, we are born with a clenched fist, we've turned our back away from God, we want to live our lives for us. That's how we all are. And because of that, 
we all stand condemned. That's the Bible. So first three points, Paul says, all people are guilty before God. Why? Because all of us have resisted the rule of God that's evident in creation. And so why are we guilty? Are we guilty because we rejected the gospel? Are we guilty because, you know, we've rejected something we haven't heard or have heard? No. The reason why people are guilty is because they've already rejected what they have heard about God, what they already know about God. And so you go, well, what about that innocent person in South America that never hears the gospel? Well, they'll go to heaven. You go, what? Yeah. Because there is no innocent person in South America. There is no innocent person in South Africa. There's no innocent person in South Carolina. There's no innocent person anywhere on this planet. We are all guilty. And we are condemned not because we've rejected something we haven't heard. No, it's because we have already rejected what we already knew about God. We all of humanity, we stand condemned. That is what the Bible teaches. Whew, that's bad news, isn't it? Well, here comes the good news of the gospel. Number four is this. Jot this down. God has made a way of salvation for all people. That's where you say amen, right? God has made a way of salvation for all people. Look at how Paul puts this. Romans chapter 2, verse 22. He says, the righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. It's found in Jesus Christ. They are justified. That means God declares us righteous freely by his grace through the redemption that's our salvation forgiveness of sins that is in christ jesus god presented him jesus as an atoning sacrifice in his blood received through faith now this is the part of the gospel that we all readily understand okay god so loved the world that he gave his one and only son i mean that's what christmas is about jesus christ stepped out of heaven took on human flesh and he walked among us and who's jesus Jesus lived the perfect life that none of us lived. But then Jesus died the death that all of us deserve. We all deserve to die for our sins. And yet Jesus on the cross took our place. I mean, that's what the word means, atoning sacrifice. You go, what does that mean? It just simply means Jesus took our place on the cross. That was my cross, your cross. Jesus took our place on the cross. The death he died, that was my death. Jesus experienced the wrath of God and the hell of God on the cross. That's what experienced there. That's what happened there. Now, how did Jesus experience that? Well, let me just put it like this. Imagine the wrath of God is being pent up, is being held back for centuries, okay? It's just being held back, almost like a dam. Imagine Hoover Dam, right? And it's just holding back all this massive amount of water. And then all of a sudden, the dam breaks. And all this massive amount of water, this torrent of water begins to rush forward. And it's about to envelop us. It's about to destroy us. It's about to overtake us. And right before it completely destroys us, suddenly the ground opens up and sucks up every bit of that water all to the very last drop. That is what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. Jesus Christ on the cross took the full fury of God's wrath, the hell that we all deserved. He absorbed every drop of it. Jesus took the cup of God's wrath and drank it to its dregs, turned the cup over and says, it is finished, paid in full. That's what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Now, we hear all that and go, whew, thank you, God. But our world will still go, well, this doesn't seem fair. I don't know about you. I don't want fair. Because let me, let me tell you what is fair. God would have been completely fair, completely just, completely good to have just said, you know what? I've had it with this rebel race. I'm done. Wiping them out. I'm done with them. That is what is fair. Okay. And so when people say, God's not fair, listen, you don't want God to be fair. You don't. You, you want to know what is not fair? I'll tell you what is not fair. It's not fair that God would send his only son to die for your sins, to take the full wrath of your hell on the cross. That's not fair. And yet that's exactly what Jesus Christ did for us. 
And so how do you receive that? Well, three times in the passage we just read, it says you must believe, you must have faith, you must put your trust in, your hope in, your reliance in who? Jesus Christ. And that's why if you reject Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross, there is salvation in no place else. That's it. This is the only way. And so then Paul, after he lays out the gospel and why the coming of Christ is so important, he then comes to this conclusion, why missions is so important. And it's number five. Jot this on your outline. Number five is this. People must hear the gospel in order to believe and be saved. People must hear the gospel in order for them to believe and be saved. Paul makes this outlandish statement. Look at what he says in Romans chapter 10, verse 13. He says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We call on you. We can be saved. What a great promise, right? Here's the rest of the story, verse 14. How then can they call on him they've never believed in? Well, they can't. And how can they believe without hearing about him? They won't. And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they're sent? So here's the conclusion, verse 17. So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the message about Christ. You know what? God's given you a promise. Whoever calls on Jesus Christ to be your Lord, you will be saved. But Paul says, but... If people never hear the gospel, if they never hear that message, they can't call on him to be saved. So that is why we do missions. That's why we as a church send missionaries all around this world. Because we want the message to go forward. We, we know it's, they, they've got to hear the message for them to be saved. That's what the Bible teaches. That's why a couple years ago we adopted the Basoto People Group. You go, who are they? They were a people group in the western province of China who had never heard about Jesus Christ. They didn't have a gospel witness. And so we as a church said we, there's hundreds of thousands of people that's never heard about Jesus. We're going to take the gospel to them. And so we as a church decided we're going to get the Bible translated in that untranslated language. We're going to support missionaries that are going to be there. And now today, because we decided to do that, there are now believers among the Basuto people. That's what's happening through your church. But listen to me. They would have never believed if they hadn't heard the message. I mean, look again at what Paul says here. Look at his logic. You can see it up on the screen. God sends out Christians. That's you. Christians preach, share the word. People hear the word. The hearers believe. The believers call on Christ, and everyone who calls on Christ is saved. But that entire process stops at the very beginning if you don't share. If you don't go. If you don't share. You see, that's the part that we need to understand here. That's why we do missions. Because the gospel never goes forward apart from a human instrument. God's working around this world. He's wanting to save this world. But there's no plan B. God only brings the gospel forward through his human instruments. That's us, other Christians. Now you may go, well, well, in the Bible, aren't there these times that God sends angels to send messages? Most definitely he does. But what's amazing is, is that the angels don't share the gospel. They always point them to someone who will share the gospel. I mean, I, I think a classic story of that is found in Acts chapter 10. You've got this righteous dude. His name is Cornelius, Okay. And Cornelius, he's this righteous dude, and God sees his heart. What, what's Cornelius doing? He's responding according to the, the revelation he has appropriately. Look at it. Acts chapter 10, verse 1 says this. There was a man in Caesarea named Cornelius. He was a devout man and feared God along with his whole household. He did many charitable deeds for the Jewish people and always prayed to God. So guess what? He's a seeker. And God sees the hearts of seekers, and God's going to make sure that those seekers are going to hear the gospel, right? And so what happens? Verse 3. About 3 in the afternoon, he distinctively saw in a vision an angel of God who came in and said to him, Cornelius, staring at him in awe, he said, well, what is it, Lord? The angel told him, your prayers and your acts of charity have ascended as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa and call for Simon, who's also named Peter. You go, angel, why didn't you just tell him the gospel? 
because God doesn't work that way. God always requires a human instrument. And so the guy goes and gets Peter. Peter, the apostle Peter, comes, and what does Peter do? He shares the gospel with him about Jesus Christ. And then look at the very end of what Peter says. It's Acts chapter 10, verse 43. All the prophets, Peter says, testify about him, Jesus. That through Jesus' name, everyone who believes in Jesus receives forgiveness of sins. Now, what's interesting is what Peter didn't say. Peter didn't say, hey, I'm just here to announce to you that because the sincerity of your faith, you're already saved. Peter doesn't say that. He goes, no, I know you're a righteous dude, Cornelius, but here's the deal. You must believe in Jesus Christ for you to have forgiveness of sins. And when Cornelius heard that, he believed on Jesus Christ, and he was forgiven. Do you understand God's working around the world, but he always requires a human instrument. I shared um, this fall when I came back from the Middle East that I had a chance to, to meet a number of our, um, you know, Muslims who had converted to Jesus Christ. And the thing that put them on that path of conversion was often a vision or a dream. And it's amazing how many, you hear these stories over and over and over again, of how God's working in these unreached people groups around the world, especially the Muslim world. But here's the deal. Even though they had a dream or a vision, they weren't saved because of that. It always took a human instrument after that. Um, I, I, most of you may have know Pastor um, J.D. Greer. Um, he tells of a time whenever he was in a, on a short-term mission trip to Indonesia. And um, while he was there, he was just walking down the street, and suddenly this Muslim man comes running up to him, and he goes, Do you know the gospel? And he goes, yes. And then the, the man tells him this story. Tells him of this dream that he's had the last three nights. He said, I, I went to bed and I, I had this dream. It was very vivid. It was like no other dream I've ever had. That I was in this wilderness, a wasteland, a desert. And I felt so alone and isolated. And that's the way I felt with God and felt in my life. And then suddenly there was this being, you know, dressed in this brilliant white. And they're holding the Bible and said, believe the gospel. And I go, no, that's heresy. And then the dream ended. And then the second night, I had the identical dream. And then this glorious being holds the Bible and says, believe the gospel. And, and I said, no, that's heresy. And the dream ended. And, and then he was like, I, I didn't even want to go to bed the third night because I knew that dream was going to come again. And sure enough, he went to sleep the third night. And, and suddenly, it was the identical dream. The only difference is this time, the being said, Believe the gospel. This is your final chance. And then the dream ended. And when he got out of bed, he looked around and he noticed here's this white guy thinking maybe he knows the gospel. He goes to him. It's J.D. Greer, the pastor. And he says, do you know the gospel? And J.D. says, uh, yes, I do. And then the man tells him this dream. And Pastor J.D. goes, um, God's given me the ability to interpret that dream for you. In fact, let me tell you about the gospel. And he basically shares the gospel that I just shared with you. And whenever he comes to the place of where God sends his son to die on the cross, to take the wrath of God for all of this man's sins, this man is overwhelmed with the love and greatness of God, and he starts crying out, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, meaning God is great, God is great. It was not a cry of terrorism the way we think of it is. It was a cry of revelation. My God is amazing. His love is great. And then he calls on Jesus Christ to be his Lord and Savior. Now, Pastor J.D. makes this conclusion. He says, I believe God is working in the hearts of people all around the world. But I needed to be there to share with him the message of the gospel. I mean, that's what's happening with Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. God is working in the heart of Cornelius, right? But Peter needed to be there to share the gospel. There are millions, if not billions of people around this planet that God is working on their lives. But we need to be there to share the message. Why? Because the gospel does not go forward apart from human means. We are God's means. We are plan A for God, and there is no plan B. And so, that's true. That's what the Apostle Paul's been teaching us here. Then this final truth I want you to jot down. Number six is this. The task is urgent. The task is urgent. If there is no plan B, if the, the only way the gospel goes forward is through a human instrument, that means this is urgent times. Now, let me put it to you like this. Just statistically, 
best statistics say that, you know, at most, one-third of the population of the world are believers in Jesus Christ, okay? That means there's 4.5 billion people who are not followers of Jesus Christ. Here's the sad reality. 2.2, I mean, 2.2 billion, almost one-half of that, have little to no access to the gospel. You see, we go, well, why don't they just believe the gospel? Well, here's the deal. 2.2 billion people on this planet have little to no access to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's not on God. That's on us. That's our responsibility. Now, we hear that statistic, 2.2 billion dollar, um, million, billion people. Well, oh, um, you know, whatever. Just a statistic. No, it's not a statistic. These are people just like you. People that feel like you and love like you and have hurts just like you. And they will spend a Christless eternity without Jesus Christ. That's why Paul passionately preached the gospel to the ends of the earth. Because he knew it was dependent on us. There is no plan B. It's urgent. That's why we do missions. That's why we send out missionaries. That's why we give over a million dollars away to missions. Why? Because it's on us. That's God's plan. And so, if that's the gospel... There's only three responses to it. And so you can see these. The first response is, you know what? You can deny it. You can hear what you heard today and deny it. You go, I don't like that. You know what? I, I just, I don't like that about God. And so I'm just going to deny it's true. And you just become a universalist like the rest of our culture, right? And you can deny it. And say, so, you know what? That doesn't fit with my lifestyle, my belief system. So I'm going to change the word of God so that it will fit what I want to believe. Okay? You can deny it. Or... You can ignore it. That's what most of us in the church do. We just ignore it. We'll give lip service to this and say, yeah, Jesus is the only way. But what do we do? We just, we're functional, you know, universalists. We think it's all going to work out. And we just get busy in our, you know, in, in church, in our God club. And we keep pursuing the same things we've always pursued and all the toys of this life. And when we hear there's 2.2 billion people that have never heard, we go, la, 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 la. I don't want to hear that. And we're just going to ignore it. That's what most people in the church do. You can deny it. You can ignore it. Or the third thing you can do, you can embrace it. You can go, okay, if Jesus wasn't lying, if the Bible is true, then I need to respond just like the prophet Isaiah, here my Lord, send me. That God, I, I'm going to allow this to affect my life. I, I'm going to partner with these missionaries, with this church. I'm going to be a part of bringing the gospel to the ends of the earth. And so, I really believe, it gets down to this. Do you really believe the gospel? Do you really believe the word of God? Do you really believe in Jesus Christ? Because I believe that if you just have a basic understanding, normal compassion would compel you to live a different kind of life. I mean, I mean think of it this way. Imagine if, if you see a little toddler who's about to stumble into you know, a traffic exchange and get run over and you saw that was about to happen, what would you do? You would stop everything you were doing, and you'd rush over to that child and grab and rescue that child, right? That's normal compassion. And yet, we in the church can hear that there are 2.2 billion people on this planet who have not yet heard, and we go, ho-hum. No, if we really have normal compassion, and we really believe this is true, then you know what? It would radically change our lives. Folks, it's time that we stop playing games. It's time that we stop playing church. It's time that we stop playing and collecting the toys that everybody else in this world collects. I want to order my life around the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we're called to do. And so you have the choice. You can deny it because you don't like it. You can ignore it and just give lip service to it. Or you can embrace it and let it radically change your life. Why does our church do missions? Because the gospel demands it. And if the gospel demands it, it demands it of you.